All right, welcome to this video on statistical degeneracy, or, and this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, basically all of probability. So let me start with a question. What makes some outcomes more probable than others? And let me relate that to another question, which is, where should you build your hotels in Monopoly? Now, it's been a little while since I've played Monopoly, but my recollection is you start here on Go, you've got that cool fancy car, and if you roll two dice for your movement, you're going to get an outcome between 2 and 12. And if you're trying to make this car land on your hotel, you need to decide where to put it. So which is the most probable place for this car to land? Well, each die that we roll is uniformly likely to get the outcome of 1 through 6. And when you roll two dice, because you can pair any result from the first die with any result from the second die, you end up with a convolution of the two outcome distributions, which is a triangular distribution ranging from 2 to 12, and there's only one way to add up to 12, but in the middle, you have various ways of adding up to 7. For example, you could get a 1 on the first die and a 6 on the second. You get a 2 plus a 5, a 3 plus a 4, a 4 plus a 3, because we're talking about two different dice here. So a 3 on the first die and a 4 on the second is actually a distinct outcome from the 4 on the first die and a 3 on the second die, a 5 plus a 2, and a 6 plus a 1. Which is to say, of all the 6 times 6 being 36 outcomes, there are 6 different ways of adding up to 7, which means that 7 has a 6 out of 36, or 1 sixth chance, of coming up on the dice. If you drop down from that, 6 and 8 both have one fewer ways of adding up. And so in the particular setup we have here in Monopoly, if the car is sitting on go and we can't actually build on the seventh place where we would put our hotel would be on the six and the eight because those are the most likely to come up on the dice. But this brings us back to our original question here. What makes some outcomes more probable than others? And based on what we just saw with Monopoly, the answer is that what makes one outcome more probable than the other is the number of ways that there are of generating that outcome. And this thing right here, the number of ways of generating that outcome, that is what we call degeneracy. Or to say it another way, it's the number of microstates in a macro state. In our example from Monopoly, the macro state is the sum that you're trying to get, 7 for example, and the microstates are each of these individual die rolls here that all map onto the same macro state of 7, which is to say there are six distinct microstates or six distinct configurations that we all group under one heading, one macro state called 7. So the reason 7 is a more likely outcome is because 7 has the highest degeneracy of all the macro states that we're considering. There are more ways, more microstates that result in the number seven. And I think it's fair to say that all of probability basically comes down to calculating the degeneracy of different outcomes. For example, in poker, a straight flush is worth more because it is less probable. Because of all the possible straights and all the possible flushes, there are fewer outcomes that give you both straight flushes, which means they have less degeneracy than either straights or flushes. Now there's something of an art to calculating degeneracies. For example, deciding what to count and what not to count in your degeneracies. The safest approach in general is to count everything, but in general this is very tedious. For example, suppose I had two decks of cards that I was playing poker with. For example, a blue deck and a green deck. And I wanted to know what are the chances of getting a straight flush. So if I wanted to count all the ways of getting a straight flush, there's getting a straight flush with the blue deck, and there's getting a straight flush with the green deck. And the chances of getting that are out of all the configurations of the blue and green decks. And in this case, we're not mixing these decks together. We're keeping blue deck with blue deck and green deck with green deck. Well, obviously the chances of getting a straight flush with the blue deck are the same as getting a straight flush with the green deck. And all the configurations in the blue deck are also equal to all the configurations in the green deck. So in the end, this ends up to be two times the number of straight flush configurations on a single deck over two times all the configurations of a single deck. And the twos cancel out, which is to say the degeneracy that had to do with the two different deck colors was unimportant because it showed up in the numerator and the denominator of our probability. So generally, although it's safest to count everything, the smarter thing to do is to only count what is actually different between the microstates and the macrostates.
So you don't need to count degeneracies for things that appear in the numerator and the denominator of your probability. Now that's basically all you need to know about degeneracy. I just wanted to show you one last thing that's pretty cool for anybody who's seen the Boltzmann equation before. So the Boltzmann equation is a statistical equation that relates the number of particles or configurations that you'll find in a given energy state to the energy of that state. And it says that the number of particles in a given state i is proportional to the degeneracy of state i times this exponential right here, which relates the energy of state i to the thermal energy in the system, kT, the Boltzmann constant times temperature. Now we've already discussed degeneracy exactly, so we know what we mean when we say g sub i, the degeneracy of state i. Now essentially what we're doing is calculating the probability of getting a particle in the ith state where i is characterized by the energy e sub i. So e sub i is the macro state and g sub i is calculating the degeneracy of that macro state, all the different ways there are to be in that energy state e sub i. But given what I was talking about before, you might ask why there's any other parameter other than the degeneracy. Shouldn't the degeneracy completely determine the probability? Where does this exponential exponential here come from? And the fun answer to this question is that degeneracy does account for all the variation in the probability of the ends, the number of particles in all the different states i. That in fact this exponential is part of degeneracy, which is to say this exponential, the e to the minus energy over kt, is another degeneracy term. And I just wanted to tell you where it came from. So you can think of thermal energy, this kt, as an energy bar which is the total measure of all the energy there is available in the system. And that energy is going to get divided among all the particles that are in a system, all the things that can carry energy. So we chop off a piece of our energy bar and we give it to particle one. We chop off another piece of our energy bar and we give it to particle two, and so on. And let's actually choose how much energy we hand to each. We'll, we'll quantize it. We'll make it into these little units, these chunks of energy bar, and we'll just hand them out to all the particles into the system. And we'll make sure that there are more chunks than there are particles. So some of the particles will get more than one unit of energy. And it's possible that some of the particles might not get any of the energy bar. Now, one possible configuration would be if we gave every particle in the system, one, two, three, on all the way up, the exact same amount of energy. And let's say that's two units of energy. So every particle gets exactly two units of energy. So this configuration where everything is completely equal is one allocation of the total energy kT among all of these particles. And I want to know of this allocation, how many sub configurations are there? How many rearrangements of this are there? And because every particle got the exact same amount, there's nothing I can shuffle around to make a rearrangement of this configuration. Every shuffling of the energy among the different particles results in the exact same configuration I already had. It's as if I rolled a die and rolled a three on one and a three on the other. And I can switch the order of the two, but I still end up with two threes which is to say there's only one configuration of a system where every particle gets the exact same amount. Another configuration would be if half the particles got double the amount of energy and half the particles get none. And in this configuration, we can ask the same question. How many rearrangements are there? So the first thing to realize is just like in the top configuration where everybody had the same energy, if I rearrange particles within the group that they're already in, it's the same configuration. They still end up with the same energy, nothing changed. So the only rearrangements that actually matter are if I exchange a particle from this first group of one to n over two, where n is my number of particles, if I exchange one of those particles into the group that has no energy, and I take one of those particles and I cycle them back into this configuration and give it more energy. And if I wanna count how many rearrangements there are there, the answer is I take all of the possible orderings of one to n, which is n factorial, and I divide it by the rearrangements that I don't care about which in this case are the rearrangements of n over two in the first group and the rearrangements of n over two in the second group. And you can see that in fact, the one configuration that we had in the top case was actually n factorial divided by n factorial. And in fact, you can see from this that any partition of these particles into two groups, one that gets some of the energy and one that gets less of it, will be n factorial over a factorial, which is the number in the first group, 
divided also by n minus a factorial, which is the number in the second group. Now here's a funny thing. If you want to partition into more groups, what you can do is just take the first partition into two groups and subdivide that partition, the second partition, into another group. And that gets you three groups. So you end up with n factorial over a factorial times n minus a factorial times, and now we're going to partition the second group, n minus a factorial into b factorial and n minus a minus b factorial. Which is to say of the total n, we started off grabbing off a here, and this was n minus a, and now we're further subdividing that into a, b, and n minus a minus b. And each time you do this, you can see that this partition into two groups, there are more configurations than there were of everybody being in the same group. And when we divide even further into more groups, we end up with a number that similarly is the original number times a number that's bigger than one. So there are more arrangements of these particles the more groups we divide them into, which means it's very probable we're going to find these particles all with different amounts of energy because there are just way more configurations in which all the particles have different amounts of energy than if they all had the same amount of energy. So if we keep doing this and keep subdividing on and on and on and on, you'll notice that the arrangements of the group that we're about to subdivide always cancels out. And if we take it all the way until this thing ends up going to one, we'll have the total arrangements, which I'll call capital G, is equal to n factorial times the product of one over n sub i factorial with i ranging over all the groups that we might divide these particles into. Now there's one mathematical trick which I'll just pull out here, which is called Stirling's approximation, which is just a mathematical approximation that says that n factorial is approximately equal to n to the n times e to the minus n. So we use Stirling's approximation, and the last thing we want to do is find the arrangement that maximizes g. g being the total number of arrangements, we already established that that is essentially a macroscopic degeneracy. It's counting the number of different ways we can arrange particles among these energy groups. And the higher g is, the more likely it is we'll find ourselves in that configuration. And it turns out there are some mathematical tricks that go into maximizing g. For example, it's easier to maximize the natural log of g, which is fine. We can maximize the natural log. It's the same as maximizing g. And one last little thing I'm going to do is entertain the possibility that we could have another degeneracy for an energy state i that might have to do with some other intrinsic property of the particles at that energy, g sub i. And we'll use a numerical technique that I'm not going to get into, but it's called Fermat's theorem of stationary points which just introduces another variable into this maximization in order to help us find where the likelihood is maximized. But it turns out it happens when we get at the sum over all our partitions. So you use that, and you also need to normalize for the total amount of energy in this problem, that all the energy eventually has to add up to kT. So that means when you add up all the number of particles in all the different energy states, it has to end up in kT, blah, blah, blah. So math happens, and you end up that the number of particles in state i has to be proportional to the degeneracy of that state i times e to the minus the energy of that state over kt, where this proportionality is just an equality up to a normalization constant that gets your number of particles to add up to the correct number of particles. And critically, this exponential here came from Stirling's approximation right here, approximating the number of different reconfigurations of a state as an exponential. So really, in the Boltzmann equation, you end up with a term that is the degeneracy of the energy partition itself. That's what this exponential is, times a degeneracy that has to do with the particular particle configurations having a potentially unique degeneracy in that state i. And what this says is that the Boltzmann equation, one of the fundamental equations of statistical mechanics that talks about the probability of finding particles in different energy states, all boils down to degeneracy. That it's the degeneracy of the particles in that state, and it's the degeneracy of the energy partition function for dividing different particles among different energies. Which kind of shows that this glib answer, that all of probability is just calculating degeneracy. It's actually kind of true, and that's statistical degeneracy.